Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we're continuing our series on the Beatles albums, checking out a few variations of them, how they look, what they contain, and how they sound. And today, on our fourth episode, we're incidentally looking at the fourth studio album by the Beatles, released on the 4th of December 1964, Beatles for Sale. So stick around. So the variations that we have uh, to look at today are three vinyl records and um, three CDs, also with a couple of bonus CDs, and you'll see what I mean a little bit later on. So as mentioned in the intro, this was released first in uh, 1964, in December, just in time for Christmas, as a lot of people like saying. That was, of course, uh, part of those two very heavy years for the Beatles, starting with 1963 early on when they released Please Please Me and then uh, and, and their single Love Me Do and then um, uh, working through the other two albums with the Beatles, Hard Day's Night, as well as releasing their movie, as well as releasing a bunch of other singles. And then at the end of 1964, they put out Beatles for Sale. Now the album itself is, uh, to me, surprisingly, one of the least favorite or the least preferred Beatles albums, even for the majority of fans, it seems. Um, I do not understand that stance. For me, it's not among the, the least favorite albums. It's usually like, for, for most Beatles fans that I've seen, like in different polls over the internet and so on, um, aside from Yellow Submarine, which seems to be the least favorite for everybody, um, this one is the like, next to last. So uh, for me, it's not the case. I really love this album and it'll make it apparent as we talk about, about it in the next few minutes and talk about the songs as well. Um, it was a special album in the sense that it came at the sort of end of two very heavy years for the Beatles as they uh, rose to fame. Um, they had very, two very intense years in 1963 and 64. Basically, without having almost any vacation, um, they ran through uh, shows very often, doing a lot of tours as well, touring America, um, of course, and putting out four albums and a few other singles and of course the EPs, but the EPs were mostly based on the albums as well. Um, so they recorded a lot, they performed a lot, they appeared on television, they appeared on radio, on the BBC. Um, this came at the end of almost the end of those two years, so it, it kind of represents very well the state of mind and physical state that they were in, because they were uh, rightfully so exhausted. Um, and the whole album versus, especially the previous one, the Hard Day's Night, has a more downbeat mood, and that is visible from the front cover as well. Uh, and the picture was not uh, chosen to be um, performed like this by accident. Uh, so, you know, it very well represents uh, the mood that they were in and the state that they were in. And the songs, uh, as opposed to the previous album, which was the first one where all of the compositions were Beatles compositions, Lennon and McCartney specifically, this one uh, went back to the formula that they used for the first two albums, for Please Please Me and With The Beatles, where they, are, uh, they have their own compositions, but they have a very uh, consistent uh, number of covers. Aside from the eight original tracks that they included on this album and the six covers that was also included on this album, they, in the, almost the same period they put out uh, another single, uh, which was I Feel Fine with the B-side, She Is A Woman. Uh, the recording for the album itself, and including I Feel Fine, was um, uh, done between uh, August and October, but um, on scattered dates. Uh, when they managed to record uh, all of these songs. Now the covers that were included were Rock and Roll Music, which was originally uh, by Chuck Berry, Mr. Moonlight by Roy Lee Johnson, uh, the, um, let's say, medley or combination between Kansas City and Hey 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 by Jerry Labor, uh, Mike Stoller and Richard Penniman. Um, there were a couple of uh, songs by Carl Perkins, Honey Don't, which was sang by Ringo and Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby and uh, Buddy Holly's Words of Love. Basically, the album, as the Beatles themselves mentioned, was a sort of a reflection, of, a partial reflection of their set list that they were playing in clubs earlier, especially the covers, of course, and uh, that they started also playing uh, on bigger stages uh, after 1963. 
Now, I don't have any of the early pressings of this album from the 60s and 70s, of course, but uh, I do, what I do have is this 1980 pressing from the Netherlands, um, which was part of the BC13 box that I shared on the channel again. Um, and this is kind of the oldest item in, in the collection. So let's take a look at it and then we're going to go through all of the others. So uh, as you can see for this one, it's uh, a pretty basic reproduction of the original one. And this was the first Beatles album and one of the earliest pop albums that was a gatefold. It wasn't really you, uh, you know, something uh, uh, very often encountered in, in pop albums at the time. Um, and of course, it had the um, uh, the track listing on, on here and, all, and uh, Tony Barrow notes, as well as this picture, and all of the elements related to the publication of the album from Parlophone and Emitex and so on, which are normally on the were normally on the back side of albums. Then they had this additional picture. The disc was housed in this pocket here, and then the back with another picture. So these pictures from the photo shoot were taken at Hyde Park by Robert Freeman. And you can see, uh, you know, like I'm talking about the mood of the album because it's a more downbeat mood. Uh, the songs are a little bit sort of sadder and more cynical, more introspective than they were before. And it kind of prepares us a little bit in terms of this approach to, to music um, to the future albums, which will become more and more introspective in that sense and more and more uh, let's say um, analytical to a certain extent. This was still early, so we do have songs that are uh, still about sort of love, teenage love and so on, but not to the extent that we had before. And uh, the way that the lyrics are treated um, is in a more, let's say, mature, cynical way, if you will. Let's take a look at the record as well. Um, I house it normally. I have an external sleeve that I put over the um, um, the sleeve of the album and then the disc is sitting on the back so I'm trying to avoid like ring wear as much as possible it's not a huge thing for me but still and uh, the the disc as with some of the others from the BC 13 I had to put in a separate sleeve uh, because the original one that I got was not the original one of the album that the album came in this is the record as you can see this sort of uh, light silver on black uh, Parlophone label uh, that was used on the Netherlands, mo most of these Netherlands discs in the 70s, late 70s and early 80s. Uh, second side, sorry. Okay, the next one that we're going to be looking at, the 2012 reissue of the album based on the 2009 digital remasters that were done for the collections that you see uh, um, you know, behind me. This one, uh, I managed to keep it in the wrap, as you see when I opened it, and with the hype, uh, hype sticker also uh, still there. Now, uh, this one is still a gatefold. I, I cannot open it because I haven't properly unsealed it, like, completely. I just unsealed it enough to uh, take the disc out and to listen to it. But I can tell you for sure that what is inside is exactly uh, the same as with the other one. We will do a comparison a little bit of how they look side by side. You'll see that there's differences, of course, in color and the quality of the picture, but other than that. Uh, and the disc for this one is a reproduction of this one. It needs to be further clean. Uh, it has, has some lint on it. I do clean it, but the static energy, you know, brings the, the dust back. So this one is a reproduction of the original uh, yellow and black parlophone label and for me it's okay because it'll be difficult for me to get some of the discs in the 60s with the original labels and have them to be in a near mint condition i said this before uh, so you know i will buy some of these newer ones that do this reproduction and for me it's it's quite enough to have something um you know to, to have this label and be able to look at it from time to time when i'm listening to the record okay second side as well Beautiful, uh, this is one of the beautiful labels that the Parlophone had, I think. I, it's kind of something that I do like, the yellow and black combination. Um, of course, there's a gold one from the Please Please Me, but... One more thing that I wanted to do is to do this comparison side by side for you, and you can see pretty well that the Dutch version um, uh, that I hold in this, in this hand here uh, has a more deeper sort of color grading for the picture. Um, and on the left one, I think it's visible, it might be visible for you, I hope it is. Uh, they tried to kind of smooth out the picture, of course, you know, being having to reproduce the original picture over and over again 30 years later, 
I'm not sure they still have the negatives for it. You know, they are kind of uh, reproducing basically the front cover of previous albums. So, and in some cases, you know, the pictures start degrading a little bit and looking um, less clear, less sharp. Not that the 80s one was looking super sharp, but um, there is a difference. And the color again, yeah, the, the, 80, the 80s Dutch one looks a little bit sort of uh, with a stronger color palette, I think. And this is also visible in, on the back. I would say pretty well. But anyway, um, even the 80s one is in pretty good condition and versus all of the other records from the or the records in the collection that I have from the BC13 box uh, that had white um, areas on the cover and on the white areas I could see those small yellowish spots on this one. They are not visible even if they are there. Now chronologically to close with the vinyl, we have this uh, third disc from the UK version of the uh, Beatles Prox from Liverpool from 1980. Uh, now this contains, so this third disc, we will see it again in the next video for help, um, because this third disc contains half songs from Beatles for Sale and half songs from Help. So um, you're gonna see here on the back, and you saw the front, the front was already a picture from the movie Help. Um, and on the back you can see the track listing uh, as well as those additional notes. Um, and if we look at the track listing, uh, like I said, the first half, it has eight days a week, no reply, I'm a loser, I'll follow the sun, Mr. Moonlight, every little thing, I don't want to spoil the party, and at the end, the eighth track, Kansas City and Hey Hey Hey. Um, so, you know, they did include three of the covers from the album here on this compilation, and all of the other five are some of the original com uh, compositions that the Beatles had for this album. And then, like I said, they're very detailed and nice, um, you know, notes from Hugh Marshall. Okay. Um, and I have to say that as for the others, most of the songs, uh, and I'll get to it when we get to the sound part of the video, but most of the songs that are included on here from Beatles for Sale sound excellent on this disc, with the caveat of the fact that the bass is a little bit uh, lowered here, it's a little bit shy because of uh, potentially because of the big number of tracks that were included on each side, right? Normally on an album you'd have seven, six, seven tracks, uh, and on this one, and most of them actually from this collection, you have eight per side. Uh, but anyway, we'll get to the sound uh, near the end. Now, we didn't take the records, the vinyl records, quite chronologically. I mean, in terms of the Beatles for sale, we did, because we looked at the 1980 and 2012, but then we get, went back to 1980 for the um, Beatles box from Liverpool disc. Um, now we're going to take the CDs, and we, we are going to take them in chronological order. So the first one is the 1987 uh, first issue of Beatles for sale on CD. Uh, now, this one is the last one that was issued in mono. Um, as were the first three that I, I showed in the previous videos. The next one, as from Help, will be in stereo. And of course, they have this booklet I will take out, which is the front, and then on the back, again, the track listing, the same kind of format that they used on the other two, on the other three albums. The AAD uh, moniker here, uh, where you can, you know, infer that the disc was created based on um, uh, an analog recording, uh, an analog mixing, and then I just a remaster for the CD. Well, let's take the booklet out as well. And in the meantime, we'll also see the disc itself. Uh, I cleaned this, but I think I manhandled it a little bit earlier. So it's the just a classical disc from the early late 80s, early 90s, you know, silver with the black, but it's quite nice. Um, very good condition, this one as well, excellent condition. Um, and then the booklet. Oh, the booklet is very similar to the others. It has, of course, reproduction of the front and the back of the album. Uh, but then internally, you don't have those um, elements that were ex how, exactly how they were included on the album. But we'll see that we do have them on, on uh, the more recent replicas. But, uh, of course, we, we have the, the notes from, uh, from Tony Barrow. We have the track listing as well. 
Um, and we do have this middle picture that was included uh, as well as the one that was on the inner back side of the fold-out uh, album. And then the details about the CD, the AAD, ADD stuff, as with the others as well. Next one on the list is the 2009 remaster on uh, in stereo, of course, in this digipack. Um, and again, you're already used to these digipacks. You've seen them on the channel before. You probably have them as well, some of you. So um, the back, of course, uh, this one, I kind of like the back of it. Uh, and I, I think I said that when I unboxed the, the whole box set. I do like uh, this picture that they included in here um, that you normally would not see on the original album. Now, opening it up again, the picture that was on the back uh, side of the gatefold uh, original album and then again a reproduction of the picture that they took in Hyde Park, more uh, let's say wide at this time. Of course we have the booklets here. Evidently more comprehensive than the one in the, on 80, in the 87 CD. And it kind of looks better as well. It's glossy. Quality of the picture seems better. Of course, the picture is smaller, so the resolution is uh, better. Uh, this, of course, includes the same you know, Tony Barrow notes, which are expanded on a few pages, uh, intertwined with uh, pictures. Again, the picture from the back of the album. And then from the back inner side of the gatefold of the album pictures from the recording sessions and so on. And then at the end, as with the other albums on this collection, which is really nice, is the addition of historical notes here and then some, um, some recording notes as well. Take a quick look again at the disc. Again, it's something that we've seen on this album before. And again, I really dislike the way that they are pocketed in this uh, DJ pack, but that's it. Again, the very beautiful yellow and black Parlophone label. Nicely reproduced for this album, I think. Now, let's move on to the last version of Beatles for Sale that I have, which is this uh, mono version uh, on CD from the Beatles in Mono box. And that, again, you've seen on this channel before. Now, uh, as opposed, because all of the other reproductions in the mono box, as you know, they were perfect reproduction of the vinyl uh, releases from the 1960s in terms of uh, being my mini uh, replicas. And this one as well with the gatefold, very nicely done with the inner uh, folds here as well, as you can see. Glossy with the back. And a very nice, I really love these small spines. Uh, these, I really love these small spines. I am not sure if you can see them, but I um, really like uh, the miniature part of it. And of course, uh, this one, again, is a little bit problematic for me. The way that they put the disc inside, um, I'm, I'm, they're trying to replicate the original one, but it's a bit difficult to get out without kind of bending the, um, you know, the sleeve. But of course, inside, because this is the mono release, we have the inner sleeve replica writing and all and of course the disc housed and this poly inner japanese style poly inner let's take it out I'm trying to keep it still beautiful i really <laughs> you know in a previous video when i was presenting the box set you know, I really dreaded taking these out and putting them in back in many times and scratching them and so on, but I really like taking them out and looking at them. So yeah, this is Beatles for Sale and Mono from uh, the 2009 Mono box set. Now, before uh, we move on to the sound and how some of these songs seem to sound to me on these different versions compared, I want to talk about how these songs were released in the US as well. And we do have a couple of uh, CDs here to show to, to kind of base that on. In the US, as most of you probably know, these were not released as part of a Beatles for Sale album, but rather part of two albums. They were kind of split around. The first one was Beatles 65. We have a replica here from the Beatles in uh, Capital Albums, uh, Beatles in the US, sorry, box set that again is behind me. So Beatles 65, where here um, we had a part of the songs and also they included um, you know, the single uh, I Feel Fine with She's a Woman, uh, both included as well. And then the rest of the songs are on this 
album, which came uh, sometime later, which is Beatles 6. And here they included the rest of the songs, you know, Kansas City, Eight Days a Week, and so on and so forth. So on Beatles 65, um, we have, aside from like I said, I Feel Fine and She's a Woman, um, and they added I'll Be Back as another track, and then we have No Reply, I'm a Loser, Rock and Roll Music, I'll Follow the Sun, Honey Don't, Babies in Black, Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby, and Mr. Moonlight, which are taken from Beatles for Sale. And on Beatles 6, um, we have the rest of the songs that were left off of this from Beatles for Sale, uh, eight Days a Week, Words of Love, Kansas City, I Don't Want to Spoil the Party, Every Little Thing, and What You're Doing, of course, coupled with other tracks as well from other albums or other releases. We're talking about sound and how I, I feel like these sound to me. Uh, I did listen a little bit to Beatles 65 and Beatles 6 as well. I don't see them as being uh, so radically different from the 2009 remasters, also because mostly they were based on the 2009 remasters with some EQ choices to kind of match the original mixes. But to me, you know, that were done for the US, but to me, I, I just didn't feel that much of a difference that, you know, it makes sense to compare that too much. So um, I just brought them for, you know, display purposes and to kind of put a point of reference to the US um, uh, version uh, of these songs and the way that they were released on these albums. Now, when it comes to the songs themselves, uh, we're going to start with No Reply. So for this one, uh, listening to um, basically Beatles for Sale, the two vinyl releases, the ver some versions of these songs from uh, the Beatles box from Liverpool and these three, um, CD releases, stereo and two mono releases, I can say that the mono 2000 CD just sounded warmer with the low end was a little bit stronger and the bass seemed more intense and it's just a little bit louder than the 87 mono CD when it comes to volume. But otherwise, it's very good quality for this song, no reply on both. So I, I you know, this is a very pleasant listen as well, at least uh, from my experience. Um, now, when it comes to the stereo, uh, at least for the Dutch stereo from 1980s, and comparing that to the 2009 stereo CD and the 2012 vinyl, which are based on the same remaster, basically, I can say that the 80s Dutch has just a bit more reverb. It has a nice separation of instruments, so you can hear them very clearly. Uh, the vocals are centered, which is nice for, for a mix of a stereo mix from that time. Um, you can hear the, the drums and cymbals are more prominent, uh, and there's quite a little surface noise, which is very good, at least for this song. Now, when it comes to comparing the 2009 CD uh, stereo with the Dutch pressing, the vinyl pressing, and I'm doing that because for me to compare, I, I can only l hear one vinyl record at a time and one, c and one CD at a time. The CDs I can switch because I have a CD changer, but if I want to compare the sound very closely, like change from one to the other seamlessly, the only way I can do it is with one vinyl put on and one CD put on. And so in stereo, I wanted to compare the 20, 2009 CD uh, with the Dutch pressing from 1980. And I just can say uh, that the CD itself seems to be have, have just a little bit more treble and sounds cleaner. Uh, you know, the sounds is a little bit cleaner with the cymbals um, being one of the differences that I really noticed where uh, on, this, on the uh, stereo 2009 remaster, I could hear them from the left channel while on the Dutch vinyl from the 1980s they were on the right channel, more or at least more prominently, but otherwise uh, they both sounded quite good. If we want to compare the 2009 CD with the 2012 vinyl, of course the sound is identical basically except for the volume, which is higher on, on the CD, but otherwise they were based on the same remaster basically, so it makes sense. Um, overall I can say that Dutch vinyl on No Reply seems a little bit better balanced, but the 2009-2012 uh, remaster reissues seem with, to have a cleaner sound. And I have to say that also for this song, the Beatles box sound, uh, Beatles box record sounds almost as clean and as nice as the 2009 and 2012 one. Of course, with the bass a little bit lower, so you kind of have to uh, tweak it a little bit from your system to, to kind of hear it properly. 
Now the second song is I'm a Loser and for this one um, I found that there was a very similar sound in the stereo records between the 80s Dutch pressing, the 09, 2009 CD and the 2012 vinyl uh, with the newer ones just having this slightly clearer sound uh, and again the uh, Beatles box version of this song is again very close to this uh, remasters from uh, 2009 and the reissue of the vinyl in 2012. Now, when I try to compare a little bit between the 87 mono CD and this time the 80s stereo vinyl because they were kind of the closest ones together, right? This was 1980 and then the stereo, uh, the mono CD, sorry, was released at the late of the 80s. So I wanted to see when, you know, there's not so much time gone between the two releases uh, to see how they sound. Uh, and just to compare between mono and stereo again a little bit, but with other pieces than what I had before, which was these two. Um, I can say that the mono CD is punchier and it's, it's, the sound is just better defined, even if it's mono and kind of expecting stereo to hear some instruments better. But actually for this one, for this song, it, it seemed to be better uh, on the mono CD versus at least this 80, uh, 80s uh, stereo vinyl from the, the Netherlands. Now, comparing just the mono themselves, the 87 and the 2009, again, 2009 uh, sounded a little bit cleaner and with the high end uh, seemed uh, to be a little bit boosted on this one versus the 87 one. Third song that we're going to be talking about is Baby in Black. Um, here, I feel like the 2009 mono and stereo CDs completely beat the 87 mono CD and the 80s vinyl and sometimes it's by, by a long shot. Um, the 2009 uh, one sounds so much cleaner and powerful, while on the 87 mono version of Baby, Babies in Black, um, it sounds just a little bit like it's a recording of a recording. You know what I mean? Like it's um, basically they took whatever vinyl and they recorded it on CD or something. It doesn't sound like a proper mastering of the song. After these, uh, you know, three tracks that I've mentioned so far, um, I kind of started to confirm audibly that even for the rest, and that was the case for the rest, that the 2009 CD, uh, the stereo one and the stereo vinyl from 2012 12, do sound identical except for the volume on the CD, which is bigger, which was kind of expected given that they're based on the same uh, remasters. While the Beatles versions of the songs, and here I'm talking about all of the songs of um, uh, Beatles versions on the Beatles box from Liverpool, uh, Eight Days a Week, No Reply, I'm a Loser, I'll Follow the Sun, uh, Mr. Moonlight, Every Little Thing. They all sound very close to the 2009 remaster that is also on the 2012 vinyl. Um, of course, the fact that the vinyl is very clean as well helps probably, but the sound is very clear and well defined. Uh, with that lightness on the bass, which can easily again be adjusted by the system. Um, but. I have to say that just a couple of the songs, the last ones actually on the on the record, I don't want to spoil the party in Kansas City, it actually sounded a little bit muddy. And I'm not sure if it's the vinyl that is the problem, maybe it was a little bit dirty around the side and I couldn't clean it properly or maybe it was more used on that side, I don't know. But maybe it was just the way that they were put on the vinyl as well. So those are the two songs that indeed, I have to say that on the um, you know Beatles box from Liverpool disc do not sound as good as the 2012. Uh, vinyl, but the rest sound almost identical, uh, save for the bass. The next one I wanted to cover is I'll Follow the Sun. Um, to me, this is one of those ones which in which all of the versions sound really, really nice. 87 CD and mono, uh, the 2009 CD and mono both sound very nice. Uh, it just seemed to me like some part of the song, maybe especially the guitar, uh, just sounded a little bit better on the 2009 mono CD again. Um, while on the vinyl, and uh, if we're talking about stereo now, the Dutch vinyl, although the sound song sounds good overall, I did feel slightly like the vocals on the 1980 uh, Dutch record were a bit fainter, uh, while the 2012 vinyl again sounded much clearer. Maybe it's again that this is just newer vinyl, I bought it for new, um, and it's not used at all, maybe that's the case. Now the next song that I want to cover is Mr. Moonlight and this one is a favorite of mine. I know a lot of people dislike it and it's on the probably every almost every list of the least liked songs from the Beatles. But to me it's excellent. It really uh, makes John shine I think. Um, and you know with all of these songs that they were covering 
And some of the songs that they were writing afterwards, like some of Paul's songs that sounded very old-timey, I think these are very important because they speak a lot of their musical taste and the, the things that they were listening to when they grew up, things that influenced them, things that they were trying to emulate. Um, and to me, this is very important, um, you know, and, and to me, it makes these songs even better. And I do like all of them. It's probably just my taste in like very old music. I really like to listen sometimes for, for things from the like 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, and so maybe that's why I like them as well. But with Mr. Moonlight, this sounds really good, like as a song for me. Uh, and I know people hate on the organ part. I even like that one. It does to some people like is reminiscent of a carousel in a fair or something. And I, I get that. But to me, it's, it kind of it brings a, a different, an interesting flavor to the song. It kind of brings it back 20, 30 years, I think, to the 20s, which is really a, a period that I'm uh, fascinated about. But as well, the guitar part, uh, actually the bass part, uh, which I f actually think is in there, and with the drums, the bongo, the African drums that they are uh, using, you know, they have this, these moments in the song when they have these build-ups and breakdowns of the rhythm of the sound with the vocals of John coming on top. And those are excellent musical moments. I really feel it, like, um, you know, uh, energized when I listen to it. So it's a, it's a really good song. But anyway, talking about how this sounds uh, on these albums. So for the 1980s, uh, 1980 actually, Dutch pressing version, it sounds really good. The vocals are very strong. The, um, you know, the sound of the bass guitar, I think it's a bass guitar, and African drums, the bongos are very well defined. Um, the 2009 is just a little bit clearer again and more, um, you know, cleaner as a sound. Um, the mono CDs, the 87 one, does sound a bit muddy, which is a bit of a disappointment. So in this case, the 2009 CD, you know, uh, the mono CD wins again. While overall, of course, as I mentioned before, um, what is on the 2012 vinyl and the uh, uh, 1980 uh, Beatles, box, Beatles box from Liverpool Disc 3 is very similar as a sound to the uh, 2009 remaster CD. The next one is a much better known song and it also gives the title of one of the documentaries that was made about the Beatles a few years back, Eight Days a Week. Um, and for this one, a similar situation as before, where the 2009 mono has the edge on the 87 mono, but just having a, a little bit clearer sound. Otherwise, this 87 CD version is quite good. Um, now, when I listened to uh, stereo and mono sequentially, uh, it did seem like the stereo overall uh, brings the vocals out better. In the vinyl section, uh, the 2009 remaster put on the 2012 vinyl does sound better than the 80s one because the 80s Dutch vinyl does lack a bit in clarity for this song. Next one, another cover, another song that I really like, Buddy Holly's Words of Love. So for this one, um, to me, it's another one that sounds very good on the Dutch stereo vinyl. Um, and, you know, the 2009 one, uh, the stereo CD and the 2012 vinyl, you know, it's just a little bit clearer, cleaner uh, sound. But this time, I wouldn't say that it's radically better. So pretty good, pretty good version on this pressing. They are both a very pleasant uh, listening experience. In the mono, both uh, versions from 87 and 2009 sound great. What I did notice as a difference is that on the 2009 one, the clapping part seemed to pop up a little bit better and they just, the clapping just sounds closer to the listener. But otherwise I could find uh, very little faults with the 87 uh, version of this song. So these were the songs that I have listened to, that I compared. Of course, you can listen to all of them and I would have had probably to include um, some other versions as well, maybe listen more to the Beatles 6 and Beatles 65. They also have both mono and stereo. There would have been a lot to do, but that would cover hours and hours, not only of listening, but of talking about it. And I think the difference is at some point, at least for my year, they are minimal, right? But overall, what I can say is the Mono 87 CD versus the other three that we talked about on this channel so far um, is a little bit lacking. The other ones were stronger, I think. Uh, this one has a few faults that I mentioned. Uh, otherwise, it's pretty good. So it's not something that it's not a horrible listen, but it, you know, it does have a few uh, gaps here and there. Uh, otherwise, the um, US uh, versions of the albums, again, the Beatles 65 and Beatles 6, they're based on the 2009 remasters mostly, not all of them, but mostly. And so, uh, or at least the songs that are from this album. And so 
they do sound similar, although they have maybe some differences in the EQ here and there. It's not really that noticeable, at least to me. Uh, so they do sound very similar to the 2009 uh, stereo and you know mono, respectively. Now the 2000 CDs both sound very good. I do prefer the uh, this 2009 mono version versus the 87 one. When it comes to stereo, of course, uh, this one sounds really good, and the fact that it was put on vinyl and the vinyl sounds equally good is, you know, excellent. Uh, now, when it comes to the vinyl, um, I do like this Dutch pressing. Uh, it's a good pressing. It has less surface noise than some of the other records that I have. It does have some, but less than the others. Um, so just a few of the songs, like I mentioned, um, if you were to strictly compare between this one and the 2009 remaster um, that is put on the 2012 vinyl, um, the 2012 um, is a little bit better. The sound is just a little bit cleaner. Maybe it's just again the vinyl that is newer and hasn't been worn so much, but um, you know, this is how it seemed to me. And again, not to uh, understate or overstate actually, um, the most of the songs, so six out of the eight songs from Beatles for Sale were included on this third disc of the Beatles box from Liverpool collection from the UK, it's a UK pressing from 1980, um, do sound excellent. They sound very close or almost identical actually to uh, these version, this version of the album, um, with the exception again of I Don't Want to Spoil the Party and the medley with the Kansas City and Hey Hey Hey, which they do, they do sound a bit muddy. But the other six, Eight Days a Week, No Reply, I'm a Loser, I'll Follow the Sun, Mr. Moonlight and Every Little Thing, sound absolutely excellent. Now, if I were to talk absolute preferences, it's very hard to choose again, but of course uh, we can say, because I, I did this on the channel before, right? I compared, but in headphones that time, uh, the stereo and mono from 2009. So when it comes to the CDs, I kind of leaned towards um, the mono when I listened to headphones. When I'm listening to speakers, I actually tend to lean more towards the stereo version, but they are both excellent. So. Maybe the, I would say I would prefer the mono just a little bit, but uh, yeah, when listening to uh, speakers, the stereo sounds extraordinary. Uh, when it comes to the vinyl, uh, there's little choice. I mean, the 2012, at least from what I have, of course, the 2012 one does sound excellent. I could find no fault to it. Um, and so, yeah, this would be my preferred version. Well, this was about it for today. I'm curious to know which version or versions of this album do you have and do you prefer to listen to? Do you also think that uh, the 2009 stereo remaster and the subsequent vinyl pressing did this album a favor, actually? Do you also think that Mr. Moonlight is an unappreciated gem? Please do let me know all of those things in the comments. In the end, I want to extend some special gratitude to the people who have continued to watch the videos on the channel, who have subscribe, like, and even share them. Um, I want to thank every one of you who has stuck around to the end of this video for watching, and I hope I'll see you next time.